Father, we come to you tonight. We just uh, thank you again to allow us to come to this midweek service, just come to worship you. We want to continue to pray for all those that are sick and need your healing touch. Just Ruth and Teddy and Omer and just uh, all those, Lord, that continue to heal up from the operations and just all those that are on our prayer list, Lord, just be with each and every one of those and just uh, be with sick family members and just keep each and every one of us all healthy so we can come here to worship you. Father, we just, again, thank you for your son, Jesus. We just ask your blessings on this service here just tonight. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we're going to continue with our series on Genesis chapters 1 through 11. This is part 30. And last week we were in the middle of, we had looked at Genesis chapter 10. We were looking at verses 22 through 25. And I want to pick up again in verse 25. We'll read that again here in a second. And kind of continue on with what we were talking about last week. So Genesis chapter 10 verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Jotham. Now, this verse does not refer to the dividing of the earth when the seven continents formed from the original one. Remember I told you that originally it says that there was one landmass. You know, it's not that Pangea that the evolutionists teach because they distort it, and they take out India, and they twist it all around and all that stuff. But there really was one landmass. It just wasn't that Pangea that you see in the evolutionary books. But originally when God created it, he had one landmass, and then around the time of the flood, they had broke up into the seven continents that we have today. But this, that's not what it's referring to here. This dividing of the earth is not referring to that. This is referring to the, uh, you know, that, as I said, that other happened at the, with the continents happened at the time of the flood. If it happened at the time of Peleg, there would have been great destruction and large amounts of death and people and animals again, such as the earthquakes and destruction caused by such an event would have been catastrophic. It would have completely redone the landscape that was seen in the flood. You know, just like what's happening in the flood. I mean, even now, that's what causes earthquakes. It's those continental plates that are rubbing against each other. You know, each, each, there's different plates that make up all the land masses. And when they rub against each other, that's what causes an earthquake. And that's just small ones. If you actually had everything split up to literally make these continents where they moved into their places, obviously you'd have great destruction. You know, that's why it happened basically around the time of the flood. But the word Peleg means divide, which is why he was named that. What, what this uh, verse is referring to, it's not referring to the time when the continents split apart. It's referring to when the Tower of Babel, when the, when the people were dispersed with the different languages. But Peleg was born 100 years after the flood ended, or approximately the year 1757, you know, 1,757 years after creation. If you were to look at those charts that I gave you, then you would see from the time of Adam and creation up to the time when Peleg was born, it's 1,757 years. As I said, 100 years after the time they got off the ark at the end of the flood. So it shows how short a time after the flood before the people were in full rebellion against God and he had to confuse the languages in order to get people to obey him. Remember, he told everybody to disperse. They were supposed to populate the whole earth. But under Nimrod and so forth, they were all basically staying around Babylon, you know, or what was Babel then, and they built that tower of Babel and so forth. You know, we'll look at that when we get into the next chapter, but that's, that's when this happened. Was, that's what this is talking about here. When the land was divided under uh, Peleg, then it's talking about when, when the Tower of Babel, when all the languages were formed and people started getting dispersed. So it only took a hundred years after the flood for the people to have that much rebellion. You know, that it, it just shows you how wicked man really is. You know, that, that they, uh, you know, it doesn't take a long time for, for people to forget different things, what's going on. You know, it don't take long for people to forget God. For, for 100 years, the people refused to spread out across the earth. And now God forced it with the new languages and changed the people's appearances. 
You know, I mentioned that last week, that that's where you'd start having most likely your black people, your the Orientals and the, the American Indians and the, or whatever, and all the different um, skin colors and the hair types, you know, the curly and the kinky and the straight and the whatever, you know, the blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, whatever, you know, that originally you wouldn't have had all those different variations. So not only do you have a new language, but you know, the people would go like, well, he looks like me, I'm gonna go with them, plus they would speak the same language. So it forced people to go off and then start, you know, those 70 nations that we've we've gone over. <laughs> but as, as I said, it is at this time that the nations of the world would be founded, as previously you had a world government under Nimrod. You know, Nimrod, before the Tower of Babel, he basically had this one world government. But now this forced them to start these 70, you know, that's where we get our 70 nations that would come from all this. You know, and each one, remember, had said had its own tongue and, you know, or, or language. So that's when you'd have the different ones that would come about, Chinese and so forth. But the Book of Jasher says the dispersion by languages occurred in 1988 years after creation and 331 years after they got off the ark. Now, I don't agree with that. You know, that's not what Scripture says. You know, so like I said, you can't always go by... You know, the book of Jasher, it, it, it's an important historical document, but it's not uh, infallible or whatever. It's not scripture. So, you know, if something disagrees with scripture, then obviously go with what scripture says. But <clears throat> Abram would have been 40 years old at the time if this was true. But we're going to look at Abraham. Remember, I told you that, you know, I believe um, that Abraham was actually born when his dad was 130 years old rather than 70 years. We'll get into that more again later. But, you know, there's a lot of people saying that he was born at 70 years. And I kind of showed you that briefly, but we'll get into that <clears throat> in the next chapter. Uh, but the book of Jasher also said that Nimrod's astrologers had visions that said kings would come from Abram and supposedly he tried to kill Abram when he was born. Now, if the date is correct, this will show Nimrod still around at the time, as well as I previously mentioned that Nimrod was supposedly killed by Esau, who came even later as Abram, now Abraham's great-grandson. Remember, I had mentioned that according to the book of Jasher, like I said, that's not in Scripture, so we can't 100% say that's what happened. But according to the, the book of Jasher, which I, which I said, it's a historical Jewish book that you know God mentions in Scripture, then... According to that, then, then Esau had killed Nimrod. So if he was, you know, then obviously he was still around at the time of Abraham. And supposedly he got this vision, because remember, he was controlled by Satan, so it's very likely that he probably did, you know, if it's true, that he would have got get some visions, because, you know, they're going to know somewhat of what's going on, because they're up there in heaven, and, you know, they can hear God, you know, them making the plans or whatever, that we're going to, hey, have everything go through Abraham. Now, whether that really did or not, we don't know, but... You know, like I said, it's just a possibility, but again, if this is the case, we see how long the people refuse to disperse. So, you know, if those dates were correct, which like I said, I don't believe they are, so that's think it contradicts scripture. But even at 331 years, that shows how long they were rebelling and refusing to, to disperse. So, you know, that, that just shows how wicked people really are. But the first does say in the days of Peleg and not at his birth. So it is possible that it did happen this way and that Eber was foretold to name his child Peleg as the earth would be divided in states. I mean, if you look at the chart, I'd have to look again, but Peleg, I think he lived to be 200 and something years old or whatever. I have to look. But, you know, in other words, we're saying that if he went from that. 1757 years ago when he was born and he had that 200 and something that was that's supposedly where the book of Jasher is getting that those numbers from that it was later on in his lifetime not necessarily at his birth you know scripture doesn't say it was directly at his birth so you know it is possible that it was as long as it was in his life <clears throat> excuse me in his lifetime then you know it's possible that it was happened later on but it, it, whatever it was whether it was at his birth or later on it's clear, Scripture says, it was during the lifetime of Pila, which is why he had that, you know, was given that name. You know, remember that his name means divine. Now again, as I said, if this is the case, we see how long the people refused to disperse. Uh, no, I read that, let's see. 
Now God felt it was important for us to know that the earth was divided in the days of Peleg. Then he mentions it again in 1 Chronicles when listing Peleg. If you would turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 19. 1 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 19. You know, again, in the genealogy, God makes sure that for the second time that he makes sure everybody knows that in the days of Peleg that the earth was divided. He wants you to understand that this is when the time of, of the Tower of Babel dispersion was. So 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 19. Right after 2 Kings. 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 19. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, because in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jachin. That's verse 19. It clearly shows again you know, that in his days the earth was divided. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 10, and let's look at verses 26 through 30. So Genesis chapter 10, verses 26 through 30. And Jachin begat Almodad and Sheleph and Hazarabeth and Jerob and Hadaram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abiel and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Jachin. And their dwelling was from Mesha as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. Now these verses list the thirteen sons of Jackton, who was the brother of Peleg, and the other son of Eber. You know, we saw that mentioned twice. But notice it's got the thirteen sons. Thirteen is the number for rebellion. So, you know, that might be giving us a clue on how some of his sons turned out. But Genesis chapter 10, verse 31. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So we see that 26 nations would come from Shem. <clears throat> now this verse clearly shows each person became a nation with its own language and had its own land or territory just as a nation does today. Now every, every nation today doesn't necessarily have a separate language, but you know, at this time, that each one would have had its own land, just like you know, the United States of America has its land, or some other area has a, a land assigned to it. But they would also have their own language as well. And as I said, depending on the nation, some of them would have had different features of skin color or hair hairstyle, or you know, what what have you. You know, obviously there wasn't. Every nation had different skin colors or so forth. You know, you'd have certain ones that would have the yellow skin color and others would have the black and the, the red and so forth. And some would be white. <clears throat> now, Genesis chapter 10, verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So this verse again shows how each of the sons of Noah produced many nations that the earth was divided into after the flood. Now, Japheth, I mentioned this before, but Japheth became the Europeans, Ham became the Africans, Orientals, and American Indians, and Shem became the Hebrews and the Arabs. So you see how the, the different languages are, are all... Um, I mean, the different nations, you know, basically where they all came from. But all nations of the world had their start after the flood from these original 70 nations. You know, some are still here today, such as China. But many of the people are long gone as God will ultimately destroy rebellion against him. God clearly ordained nations. So again, you know, when these people are like now, guys pushing the one world government again, or they're trying to do away with nationality, you know, we all got to be people of the world. Well, that's not what God intended. You know, that God, that's not what God approves of. God approved and ordained nations. And, you know, we're not to be trying to, like, let's get rid of the United States of America or whatever nation, and let's all just become one people. You know, we, that's, that's not what God's word says. You know, God, God is clearly against, <clears throat> against the uh, one world government. 
We're going to look at, uh, but like I said, as far as all the nations today, in some way, shape, or form, all descend from these original 70 nations. You know, there's a lot of them that have went, you know, came and went, you know, not here anymore. You know, China's one of the few. But in some way, shape, or form, they're somehow descended from them. Just like, for example, the Israelites came from Abraham. Well, Abraham was a descendant of Shem. So through, you know, some of those... Shem's children, then he, you know, that's where the Israelites would have come from. So they would have still been uh, related to one of these original 70 nations. You know, they weren't one of the original 70, but they were to still be able to trace the lineage back to those 107. And that goes for every nation today that, that's, that's around. You know, like say, for example, Japan, North South Korea, Vietnam, you know, like all those type of Oriental type <coughs> countries would all be able to somehow trace their way back to. Some of the children, such as the Sinites or something like that, you know, I don't know which exactly, but, you know, they, the same type of people, you know, they'd ultimately be through him is where they would come from. Well, let's start, we'll take a look at the, uh, the last chapter here. We're going to start Genesis chapter 11. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, this verse clearly shows that the earth was of all one language originally after the flood. You know, the same applies to before the flood, which, as I had previously mentioned, Hebrew most likely was the original language. You know, this verse also says the people were of one speech, shown there was only one dialect. You know, today, even just say, for example, a lot of people speak English, but you got your British English, you got your Australian English, you got your American English, you have you know, there's a lot of, even in, even here in America, you have the southern lingo, you know, the, the, the southerners speak English one way, the northerners speak it another way, you go out west, you know, that there's a lot of different dialects depending on where you're at. So, you know, they're all speaking English, but sometimes when you go to some of these other nations, they're speaking English, but they sound like they're speaking a foreign language. I mean, I'm sure they say the same thing about us, but... You know, you didn't, originally you just had one language, as I said, most likely was Hebrew, and then you had one dialect. You didn't have all the different variations like you have today. You know, the, very, <clears throat> the various dialects most likely came about at the time of the formation of the new languages. So whenever you, God created these languages, most likely, he also made the dialect. So that's where, like, say that where you might get the Chinese and then the Japanese or Koreans or whatever or somebody like that. Where, again, it kind of forced them to spread out even more. But not only do, okay, we speak the same language and kind of look the same, but our dialects are a little bit different. So I still want to go over with this person instead of this person. So it forced the people to get closer together and it made sure they definitely dispersed out. You know, it is possible that some of the dialects came later on. You know, it's not automatically that they were there, or maybe some of them came, and then many of them came later on as the years progressed, kind of like American English, for example. You know, it came along later on after you already had the British English, and same thing with Australian English. You know, that came along later on. So, you know, it's possible that some of the dialects came later on, or they could have come, you know, originally at the time of uh, the formation of the languages. But the language can be spoken and understood by all people, but some differences make it difficult to understand meanings of certain words. You know, that's, when, that's the problem with your dialects. As I said, yeah, you go over to England, for example. Yeah, they're speaking English, but say, for example, um, what we call uh, the subway, they call it the tube. What we call an elevator, they call it the lift. So, you know, you kind of got to understand, like, well, what are you guys talking about? You know, that, that even though they're speaking English, everybody's got their own little meaning behind certain words. So you might understand, okay, they said, I, I understand lift, but they're thinking of lift in a different way than the way we use it over here in the United States or something. So, you know, it's, it's not, it just makes it sometimes a little bit more difficult with the different dialects and so forth. But Genesis chapter 11, verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now the people began to move away from the ark and settled in a plain in the land of Shinar. Now we saw from Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, 
that Nimrod set up his kingdom in Babel, which was in the land of Shinar. So they originally all kind of moved away from the ark, and then moved to, you know, depend on, we don't know the exact location, but depend on different people you talk to. Like I said, it could have been like 100 miles away or whatever, but they all headed towards the land of Shinar, which is where they had, which set up uh, the Tower of Babel and so forth. So they didn't necessarily stay, you know, they did originally move away from the ark, but then they kind of stopped there. They got to the land of Shinar and they're like, wow, this is a nice place, and this and that. And then they just kind of stayed there and they never, they never moved on. But Genesis chapter 11, verse 3. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them freely. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. The people began to make brick out of the clay that was most likely abundant around there due to the flood. Remember I said that before, that it's kind of like we have these local floods. The farmers, they get great crops after that because it brings in all the nutrients and so forth. So you get really good soil. And it was most likely the same thing after the flood. That, you know, in certain areas you would have had clay or you would have had other th types of uh, soils and stuff like that. And so this particular area most likely had a lot of clay, and that's what they used to make the bricks out of. So the, the people knew to burn <clears throat> the people knew to burn the clay in order to make the brick. So, you know, a lot of times people always do, they always think again, like, well, people weren't that smart back in those days. They knew how to make brick, at least then. And who's to say, they probably even knew how to do it before the flood. We don't know that, but, I mean, it's possible. So, you know, we always think that, oh, we're the first ones that always discover these things, or, you know, we only, we're the, you know, this stuff's only been around for two or three hundred years, or something like that. But, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's been around for a while. You know, they're not as, they weren't as dumb as everybody thinks they were. But the brick was what they used in place of stone, and they had slime for mortar. You know, it is likely that the slime was from the slime pits or tar pits that would have been prevalent after the flood from all the animals that were killed during the flood. Remember that. Uh, well, let me finish this and then I'll comment. But tar pits are still found today in places such as the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, California. The tar is asphalt or oil that seeps up from the ground. And right in the middle of Los Angeles, there's this big area where this tar just comes up out of the ground. Now scientists claim this has been seeping up for 10 to 20,000 years, but I've previously shown that the flood was about 4,400 years ago, not the older ages the scientists claim. But in these tar pits, they found many, many, many fossils of dinosaurs and all kinds of other animals and stuff like that, which obviously were killed during the flood. And then, you know, there's woolly mammoths and all kinds of stuff in there. And so, uh, you know, but most likely that's what, what the same thing was, is they had these tar pits, which basically your asphalt, that that's what they used to uh, put the bricks together, you know, to hold in place as mortar. You know, instead of like using, we use concrete nowadays, they would use this, this tar. You know, and remember I said before the ark that it said they put pitch on the ark, you know, to, to keep it waterproof. And I said that they didn't, you know, everybody's like, well, see, they didn't have tar back there, and, you know, this and that. And they tried to say it, but that, remember I told you it was actually made from trees that were di distilled. You know, they heated up the trees and they made, you know, the, the pitch from that. But now you actually have the tar. You know, that's where tar came from. It was after the flood. You know, it's from these animals that were decaying all their bones and, and all their flesh and so forth. And that's what created the, the tar. You know, that's where we get our oil from. Oil is from animals and coal comes from dead dead plants. You know, that's that's where the two of them come from. And I mentioned that before, but even like the, the gas station... Um, Oh, I can't think of the name of the one. It's got the little dinosaur for its emblem. And Sinclair. Sinclair. You know, and it shows you a dinosaur, you know, because they know where the, the you know, the, the, that's where their oil, their, their gas, gasolines come from. It's from the bones of, of these dead animals. Now, obviously, they don't believe the same thing we do, but they understand, you know, even if they're mocking it, they still understand that that's, that's where they come from. But Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city 
and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now we see the reason the people were making the bricks in verse 3 was to build a city and a tower that would reach heaven. The people found a nice plot of land in this plain and decided to build a city. Now the fact that they were using bricks shows their intent to make a permanent city as well as a tower and not a temporary place. This shows the rebellion of the people as God had told them to disperse and they once again disobeyed God by staying in one place. So we see that you know they, they intentionally were disobeying God. They they had already made up their minds they were going to build these, these cities and the, this tower and they were going to be permanent uh, buildings and so forth. That uh, you know they were they weren't intended to just oh it's a temporary shelter and then we'll leave in six months or whatever you know that it, it was they were, they planned on staying there. But the people intended to build a tower to reach the heaven. You know, we, we see that, it says right here in verse 4, it says, Let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. So the tower, that was their intent. They wanted to build this tower and city. You know, they wanted to build it all the way up as high as the heaven. But the tower was most likely in a shape of a ziggurat, which was basically a step pyramid with usually a place of worship or a temple on top. You know, it'd be kind of like those step pyramids that you've probably seen pictures of them over in Egypt, where you'd have one big area that'd be built out, and then the next one would be built in just slightly less so that you had a little step there, and then the next one would be, you know, in another, whatever, foot, two feet, whatever, so you could kind of walk there, and you could kind of, in theory, then you could kind of walk up the building or whatever. You know, they probably had a little bit more gap than that, but, you know, most likely that's that's what it was, but it would have been built in like this pyramid shape. And then usually they would always build a temple or something at the top. All your, your heathen religions that did all this, they'd always have a place at the top. Because remember, they were trying to reach the heaven. And so then they would have a worship place up there where they could worship their false gods. Now, some people have said that the tower was built to be used as a means of communication to the gods in heaven. Now, this may be true. As I said, they were trying to, to communicate, you know, they wanted, they wanted to pray to the gods and so forth. But they certainly wanted to reach the heaven where fallen angels and devils live. You know, it's possible that they were just trying to at least get to the second heaven. They weren't necessarily trying to get to, uh, or even the first heaven. That, you know, necessarily to the throne of God, that, you know, they wanted to try to get to these fallen angels and the devils. You know, remember I had, had told you that Nimrod, it's possible that he came from one of those giant, you know, he was one of those giants that, that was from the children of uh, the fallen angels that mated with, with the women. You know, scripture doesn't say, so we don't know that for sure, so I'm not going to be advent on that, but, you know, it's possible, so which again would make, would justify <clears throat> he already forcing Satan that they want to try to reach up to reach those false gods. You know, you know that's what Satanists are always trying to do. They're always trying to find a way to reach Satan and his, his devils and so forth. But now people have denied there was ever a real Tower of Babel, as they do with the rest of Genesis chapter 1 through 11. But our Archaeology that mentions it, along with the languages changed, confirms the existence of a tower, and again confirms Scripture is real, as is God and His punishment for sin. You know, oftentimes archaeology has proven things. You know, people try to say that well, David wasn't real and all that kind of stuff. Well, they found archaeological stuff that backs up Scripture, and same thing with some of this. You know, over there in. Uh, Babylon, you now whether that's really where it was or not, but what what is where Babylon was in Iraq, then uh, Saddam Hussein, supposedly that Nebuchadnezzar had tried to rebuild when he was around the Tower of Babel. And it, on their inscription they found it's still there to this day. 
that talks about how the languages were confused at the time and mentions the name Babel, whatever, you know, meaning confusion. So, you know, this backs up exactly what God was saying, you know, happened. And I previously mentioned, you know, as I said, this was probably around 100 years after the flood. And the reason that Nimrod, who was the leader of the people, wanted to build a tower was to be able to have a place tall enough that God could not flood, or at least he thought God couldn't, but mainly so they could reach their false gods and devils who were in the heaven as the heaven is the realm of the satanic realm. You know, Satan's angels, you know, they basically living around there. You know, they have access still to heaven, but a lot of them are living right now in the second um, heaven or the first heaven and so forth. And some of them, like I said, they still have access to the third heaven where God's at. But, you know, they want to try to reach these devils and so forth. You know, clearly, regardless of whatever their, what their intent was, the Bible's clear they intended to try to build to the heaven. You know, why would you do such a thing? We already know that Nimrod and some of the elders were wicked. They were already being rebellious by not dispersing. So, you know, they were not necessarily trying to reach heaven to communicate with God. That much we, we understand. They were definitely trying to deal with Satan and his angels and devils and so forth. Now, Nimrod was fully controlled by Satan and he wanted to communicate with his gods and not, not true Jehovah God. And I mentioned how it was very likely that Nimrod, a while ago, that he had that corrupted angelic DNA in him, so he was very connected to the satanic realm. You know, if that's true, it would very much explain some of the wickedness that he had. That, that uh, you know, he would very much want to communicate with, you know, if, his, if one of his dads was one of these fallen angels. But most of the people were in rebellion with him. You know, so it wasn't just Nimrod. I mean, he did control everything. But obviously, the, the vast majority of the people were in rebellion with him. Or they would have been dispersing anyway themselves. They'd be like, well, whatever. You want to stay here? We're, we're leaving. So, I mean, it shows that that uh, the control that Nimrod had on people, number one. And also how <coughs> corrupt everybody was. You know, for the, the vast majority of the people would have been corrupted. Now, Noah and a few of the righteous people may not have moved here, but Scripture does not say. So, you know, Noah and the other righteous people possibly went with them, or they might have gone to a different location or stayed somewhere near the ark. You know, we don't, Scripture doesn't say exactly. But obviously, they were not, like Noah and them were not involved in the rebellion of building these towers and cities and so forth. But Noah must have been saddened to see how wicked his descendants had become and how quickly they became wicked. As I said, this more than likely was like 100 years after, and even if it was their lifetime of Peleg, like I said, it was only 300 something. Like, you know, I'd have to look up again when he was born, but you know, he only lived, it was like roughly 200 years, I think. So, you know, you're talking basically 300 years, a little over 300 years after the flood at the most. So it was, it was not a long period of time. And remember, I showed you how Noah was still alive you know, all, all, all at this time. And, you know, he lived to be 350 years after the, after the flood. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 5. Let's look at that. Genesis chapter 11, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. So the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people had built. And as I said, the exact location of the Tower of Babel is unknown. You know, many say it was built in Iraq and the remnants of where Babylon was. And I mentioned that a while ago where Nebuchadnezzar is supposedly this, this archaeological proof. And that's possible, but, we're, you know, we don't, there, there's another possibility too. The, um, you know, that, that would have been southwest of where the ark was found. Now, one scientist who works for the Institute of Creation Research, or ICR, which I've mentioned before, believes it may have been in western Turkey in a slight southwest direction from the Ark. Now, both locations would have the people coming from the east where the Ark had landed, though the location of Turkey is more direct. Supposedly, remnants of the tower are located in the location where ancient Babylon was in Iraq. So, you know, it's... It, I, I'm not going to say it definitely was in, in Babylon. As I said, supposedly there was this archaeological stuff that, that uh, Saddam Hussein was even trying to preserve and so forth that shows that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar was trying to rebuild the Tower of Babylon. It mentions the confusion, how the, the language was dispersed and so forth. 
But we know that it had to be um, west of the location of the ark, because Scripture tells us that. So, you know, whether, you know, exactly, I mean, you know, whether it's exactly southwest, you know, the way this one is, or a little bit more westerly, the other location. I mean, the way one in Turkey would be a little bit more direct, where the one in Babylon is a little more southwest, you know, so they would, they would both be okay as far as fulfilling what Scripture says. It's just one's a little bit farther west than the other one, so you know, we don't really 100% know the exact location, but many will tell you that it's where the ancient Babylon was in what is now Iraq. Now Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So the Lord said that the people, if they work together, they could not be stopped. You know, this is why the leaders of the world are pushing so hard for a one world government and trying to unite the people in one cause against God. This first shows the people all still had one language. Now this is significant as people can work together if they all speak the same language. You know, that's one reason why English is kind of becoming the world language. You know, even in China, a lot of your Chinese all know how to speak English. You know, the, the English is one of the official languages of the United Nations, one of the official languages of the Olympics. It's one of the official languages of many things. Now, sometimes they'll have one other language along with it, but even in a lot of your, your nations that were Great Britain used to control, such as India or different places, a lot of people may speak another language, but the official government language is English. You know, it's kind of like what was happening in the days of, the, of Jesus in the Roman days. The government official language was Latin, but the people spoke Greek. So, you know, that's why I mentioned last week how, or Sunday or whatever, that Latin, once the empire kind of died off, people weren't speaking Latin anymore because the only people that are for the most part using that were your religious people, like the Roman Catholic Church, or um, the government itself, the Roman government. The average person, they spoke Greek. So, you know, it's kind of the same thing, but if you look, you know, English is very much prevalent. You know, many, 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 many people in Europe can speak English as a second language, as well as in many other parts of the world. You know, it may not be their first language, but almost anybody that can speak another language, most of them can always speak English. So it's one kind of one of those things that it has a dual purpose. We'll see that where that's one reason why the King James Bible is in English is so that it can be used to spread throughout the world. You know, I said that with Great Britain. They had all their colonies on every continent all over the world. And so they were spreading, helping spread the English language and also, you know, the King James Bible originally. And so, you know, God's trying to use it, you know, to have in that sense. But, but as far as one world government, in one sense, they kind of need to have a one world language. I mean, there's been people even over the years who tried to come up with a modified English. It's known as simple English, I think it is. And basically, it just uses, it's English, but it gets rid of all the big words. It just, you know, has limited vocabulary. And they're trying to make it so that everybody can speak that because they want, they're trying to push again a one world language. They need to have a language that everybody can speak. That, that, uh, Again, if we can, you know, if all you guys are speaking something different, you know, one of you speaking Chinese, one of you speaking French, one of you speaking Spanish, one of you speaking English, or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a lot harder to try to communicate with you, and we're trying to get something done versus if we can all speak the same language. So, you know, that was that was, but that that's basically what God was saying. That it says, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. You know, so basically, God allows pretty much if man all works together, they can pretty much do just about anything. You know, there's there, there are limits, obviously, but you know, God will allow a lot of that to happen during the Great Tribulation. But we, it also says the people is one. So it shows you that yes, I told you you had no and a few others that were righteous. They were not involved in all this, but the vast majority of the people were all in on this. They were all in on the corruption. You know, it wasn't just Nimrod, it was basically forcing these people. They 
they basically were going along with all of this. They, they didn't try to disperse or do anything. We're going to, I guess, stop here. We'll pick it up again next week in Genesis chapter 11, verse 7. So we'll pick up next week in verse 7. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time again you've given us here tonight. We just pray, Lord, for safety for each and every one as, as we go home. And Father, we just uh, thank you for your son Jesus and just uh, what he did for us on Calvary. We just thank you again for the opportunity just to come here and still have the freedom to just be able to worship you. Father, we pray that we'll be able to retain that freedom until the day you come. Father, we just ask, pray again for the health of each, all those that need your healing touch. Just be with them. Again, give us all safety and keep us all healthy. Allow us to return on Sunday at the point in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.